Welcome once again, folks, to Salford's Working Class Movement Library and our long running series of Invisible Histories talks. So long running that we're welcoming back a speaker who talked to us for the first time in 2013, back in our annex. Welcome to Lauren Murphy, who is going to talk to us about the Bradford Pitt project on which she's been working for so long. And uh, we would like to say that the talk will be recorded for future viewing on our YouTube channel. If you have to pop off early, don't worry. Also to point out, as usual, that our talks are free, but we're very happy if you are able to donate. And there is a donate button on the library website. OK, Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Lynette. Um, thank you very much for, ch for tuning in, first of all. Um, so. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, a community histories project um, called the Bradford Pitt Project that I've been running for seven years now um, with very, very personal um, and deep connections to, to myself, um, which has kind of been the driving force behind it, really. Um, I was first introduced to the Working Class Movement Library when I was doing my degree. Um, and I used um, some of the collections within the library as part of my, um, my practice. So I'm gonna go into that in a little bit more detail, but I'm just gonna share a series of images with you and talk you through um, the, the kind of um, the journey of the project, if you like. Um, so just tell me when you can see that. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, so this is just a map overlay um, of the area of Bradford, Manchester, which is now more commonly known as East East Manchester or Bezik. Um, and it's a kind of map overlay that the project has put together uh, showing the vast physical changes in the area. Um, so Bradford Pitt, so, so my, uh, my granddad, uh, the dancing man that you can see there, uh, Alan Evans, uh, was a former miner at Bradford Colliery. Um, and he suffered an accident there, which left him paralyzed uh, for most of his adult life. Uh, before before he, he had his accident, he was a really keen um, sportsman, uh, darts player, and just a general um, la larger than life figure in the community of Bradford, really. Um, when he did have his accident, they pronounced him dead on arrival at, at Bradford Colliery, um, but, um, he, he wasn't, he wasn't dead. Um, he basically um, was told that he'd never walk again, he'd never talk again, and he managed to do both. Um, he struggled all throughout his life with, with, be, with being paralyzed, but he was just such a strong character. Um, and when, when I was a little girl, I just remember listening to his stories about, about the pit, and I always knew that the reason he was how he was was because of something that had happened at the pit but he passed away in 2012 uh, whilst I was doing um, a three-dimensional design degree at Manchester School of Art um, and I was kind of coming up to my final year of practice and I thought what what can I you know what can I do my my, my final project on and um, decided I was going to do it on, on Bradford Pit. Uh, so this led me to doing a lot of, um, pardon the pun, but digging a little bit deeper in, into what happened to Bradford Colliery, you know, when, when did it, when did it close, uh, why did it close, what happened since that time, um, and my, a lot of my family live, still live around Moston, um, and there's uh, still an active uh, mining community, uh, Moston Miners State there today, um, and through kind of family connections, I, I made contact with some of my, my, my granddad's old friends from the pit um, who still live on the Moston Miners estate today. And a key, a key figure um, that um, I met was uh, this miner here called Michael Doherty. Uh, so I went, I went into his house um, and just sat and had a chat with him really. Um, and what kind of struck me was that all around his house was uh, was mining memorabilia. So Michael Michael had been um, third generation who worked at Bradford Pit. He'd, he'd he'd you know lived in that community for a very long time, um, and he'd actually started to kind of make little commemorations to Bradford Colliery and to and to his his own family. And I thought um, that's maybe not right. There should there should be 
um, there should be a memorial, um, a memorial somewhere, not just in his home. And I found that, that Mike um, had just done, done little things that really touched my heart, like written, written labels on the miners to, to kind of signify uh, the generations of his family. He'd had um, his, his granddad's tally engraved. Uh, so it was clear that, that, that he needed some kind of physical remembrance to refer to. Um, and he'd, he'd actually been campaigning um, for a long time and writing letters. Um, I mean, that, that, that um, newspaper cut in there, it actually dates back to 2003. So there's been call outs for a long, long time um, to try and, and get some, some sort of permanent commemoration to the pit. Um, so that was it really, but once I kind of had that in my mind, I thought I need, I need to kind of do something about it. So um, that's a, an image of, um, of Bradford Colliery being uh, kind of the headgear being dismantled. So it actually closed down in 1968 and was kind of demolished, if you like, uh, seams filled in um, in, in 1973. So um, that was the end, if you like. This, so this picture here is, is kind of an aerial of the site um, and it's from around the 40s. So you can see how densely populated Bradford is. Um, the, the pit itself fed um, numerous industries um, around it and there was a real, a real kind of community um, in, in that time can see there so this kind of Stuart Street power station, uh, Bradford Gasworks, um, hundreds of homes around it and a, and a community that my, my granddad and my, my family grew up in. But kind of going to, going to the Etihad site which is what it is today, um, it's very sparse, there's absolutely no, no clue that, that, that this was ever here. You can see there that there's um, that's around kind of, um, I think it's about 1998. So it's from, from the kind of densely populated area to that, it's very, very sparse. Um, so I just want to kind of touch upon this point in time when I was doing my research for my degree. Um, I, this is when I connected with, um, with the Working Class Movement Library because I was, I was my, my degree was around jewellery and worn pieces, so I decided that I wanted to kind of look into like um, pieces of worn commemoration or worn statements such as, um, you know, mining badges, ribbons, etc. Um, and I remember the library having a really, some really beautiful labour and trade union ribbons um, that I kind of took inspiration from. Um, and I also took inspiration from the miners' stories to kind of make some worn commemoration pieces um, as kind of like my final year exhibition. So this is kind of the, the pieces that came out of um, my research, basically. A little coal dust holder there. Um, so after I graduated, I was working in um, pubs and cafes and I decided I still had this in my mind that I wanted to get a commemoration for the pit. So I, I just was doing it voluntary in my, my own time. So one of the, the first things we did, um, I did was, was um, set up, um, connect with Moston Miners um, Community Arts and Music Centre on the Moston Miners Estate. So that used to be um, Moston Miners Club. Um, and um, I connected with them there because they operate as a community, a community organisation now. And I set up um, a Remember the Miners fundraiser. Um, it was basically a call out um, to kind of say, this is a cause. I didn't know how it was going to be achieved at that, at that point in time. Um, but um, actor and activist um, John Henshaw, who um, is on Early Doors, actually lives four doors down from my mum and dad so that was quite handy and he was the compare for the evening and it was kind of um a night of um a night of a mixture I wasn't expecting the turnout but it was a mixture of community members miners um my friends family um so it was to kind of raise an initial amount of money to kind of set things up within the project 
but also to just kind of um, generate a little bit of interest really. So everybody who performed that night, or, um, who were kind of musicians, poets, et cetera, actually had mining, uh, mining family members or roots. So the guy on the left with the guitar is my cousin. Uh, so that's, um, you know, uh, my granddad's um, grandson. Um, it was amazing. And to be honest, it was a bit of a messy night. Uh, I think there was a few sore heads in the morning. <laughs> Um, but it really served as like a bit of a, a bit of a kind of call out for the project. Um, the next thing I went on to do was to take part in Manchester History's Festival in 2014. Um, so from my, my research documents and kind of um, mining memorabilia and artifacts that I'd kind of collected through conversations with some of the miners, um, I um, displayed an exhibition at Beswick Library, um, which is literally just down the road from where the pit head once was. Um, and it was, again, a, an early call out uh, for information. Um, there's some more images there. It was quite, it was really well attended. Um, and this was the, these are the kind, that's my nana on the right. And these are the kind of core miners that have been involved from the very beginning. Um, most of those have passed away now, unfortunately. Um, but another thing I did was kind of, um, I invited school children from across the road at St. Bridget's Primary School um, and to, to meet the miners um, and to have a creative workshop. So they made, the, they made their own tallies with their own numbers on. Um, and the miners kind of did a bit of a, a learning session with them, which was absolutely fantastic. When the kids came in, they were, they were just kind of beguiled by the concepts of miners. They were like, are, my, are they real people? I think they thought they were like mythical creatures or something like that. Um, so, um, they started kind of draw, drawing, drawing their imaginations of what, what a pit would be, uh, what things looked like. They, some of them had never seen a piece of coal before, so that was something that really resonated with me, that there's a massive generational gap between the former mining community and the community that's there today, and, and are they aware of that, that sense of place and heritage? Um, so as part of the work that we did for Manchester Histories Festival, um, I won an award for Best Community Histories Project um, um, as a result of the work that, that, we, that was done be between primary schools. So this was, so this was in 2014 um, and John Henshaw was there again as a, as a support and, and um, a, well, during, during it, a, a man came up to me and, and said, oh, um, we're really interested in, we're really interested in um, perhaps giving you a job and I was like what um, and it was um, a, um, a man from from an organization called Lango Rock who were a huge construction company I, I didn't have a clue who they were then but they were actually sponsors of the award and they'd built the Etihad Stadium and done lots of regeneration around East Manchester um, and at the time, as I say, I was working in pubs and cafes. So I, I, they were said, come and meet us in Manchester Central Library. So I went along and, and they offered me a full-time position trying to bring the project to fruition. So it was just an amazing opportunity to be able to kind of um, really develop the project and what needed to be done to get it to the next stage because it was, um, again, me doing things in my own time and, and not much money behind it. Um, after, um, after gaining employment with Lango Rock, um, I went about kind of, um, I suppose, trying to understand from kind of key stakeholders what, what the, I suppose, what the response would be to the idea of a memorial. So I had initial emails and conversations with uh, Manchester City Council and Manchester City Football Club. Um, the general consensus really was that it was it was a, a good idea, but I'd, I would really need to build a public case and momentum around um, it happening and being able to get funding and sign off from, from really kind of high level stakeholders. Um, so I applied for funding from Manchester City Council to develop 
a, um, a community, a large public engagement programme um, that would serve as kind of evidence for the need um, and kind of understanding some, some of um, the gaps that had arisen through kind of regeneration of that area and less of lessening awareness of the heritage. Um, at this point, Lynette, I just want to, um, if we can play that little oral history. Um, so this is Michael, Do Michael Doherty just kind of talking about um, how the effects of the regeneration um, affected that old mining community. Hopefully it works. Okay, yeah, I'm going to try and share that now. Hold on. We're not sure why this BBC Radio 3 come up, but... My name is Michael Walter. I am 77 years old, born and bred in the district of Bradford, Manchester. After the slum clearance of Bradford in the 1960s, my family roots were uprooted and renamed Bessick. Before the slum clearance, the district of Bradford was three times larger than the district of Bessick. Workers came from all over Manchester to work in the many Bradford factories, like Bradford Gasworks, Marsland's Mill, Stuart Street Power Station, Phillips Park Press, Richard Johnson's Wire Works, Francis Shaw's Engineering, Mitchell's Emery Wheel, UCP Trite Works, Dean and Woods Abitair, Graymar Lane Market, Bradford Library, Mill Street Police, Fire and Ambulance Stations, Tenants Chemical Works, Bessett Diary and many more small firms. Before the closure of Bradford Pit in 1968, I worked as an underground electrician for 15 years. My father, 20 years coal face worker. My grandfather, 57 years coal face worker. The pit was the centre of Bradford community for over 350 years and supplied the coal to keep the home fires burning and to power the industrial is of Manchester. It came at a price to the miners. One miner was killed underground every five years. Many men, women and children suffered and died with the miners' disease, pneumonosilicosis. You could visit Anchors Hospital any day in the year and there would be a, an injured miner being well looked after by the nurses on Ogden Ward. The pits management and NUN union donated regular to the hospital. The regeneration and development of East Manchester is fantastic and a credit to Manchester City Council and Manchester City Football Club. At the same time, the industrial heritage of the district of Bradford and Bradford Pit has not been included in the development. To give me my family roots back, the district of Bradford and Bessick should go back to its original roots and be named Bradford with Bessick. Also a long overdue dedication to the past miners of Bradford Pitt, Mike Daugherty. emotional listening to that I think it's um it's it just kind of showcases the the effects and gaps of, of a regeneration of an area um and, and Mike's been kind of um a real driving force behind behind the project for many years um so yes I'm going back to um starting with Lango Rock and developing kind of public momentum and engagement in order to evidence the need to, to mark the pit. So um, I um, developed, um, can everyone see that okay? Lynette.
Can you see, can everyone see that? I've, I've got the recording running again. Can you hear the recording running again? No, oh, I right. can. <laughs> we can see. We're really can confused. I'll mute, I'll mute myself as long as you can't hear the recording. Okay. Um, yes. So um, I, I, I went back to Manchester School of Art where I'd done my degree, and um, now we've got this money from Manchester City Council to develop the community engagement programme. I commissioned a series of artists and makers to uh, run some workshops, um, creative workshops with schools. Um, and I also organised a series of kind of call out events. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the engagement highlights um, from that period. Um, so the first the first kind of call out and this was this was kind of in 2015 uh, was Bradford reminiscence session. And um, so one of the one of the main objectives um, behind the project has been to um, generate generate material because there's, there's absolutely no evidence um, of the pit or the community remaining. And I found that that when I was doing my research, I was scrabbling around from here, there and everywhere to try and find find pictures, um, you know, documents, things like that. Um, there was absolutely nothing. And one of the most kind of things that really, really shocked me was that um, there was nothing in Manchester Central Library about, about Bradford Colliery or, or about the community. So one of the main the main objectives was was around generating an archive. So Bradford Bradford Pit um, reminiscence session served as as an as initial launch for the engagement, but we also um, called out for oral history volunteers and trained people up um, around that skill, and um, we sourced interviewees from this session, um, and we developed twenty five oral history interviews from this session. Um, but really, it was quite an amazing, um, that's my nana there with um, a lady called Rita, who she hadn't seen for 50 years. Um, so there was probably about 60 people there, um, many of whom had, had not had not kind of met up since since childhood days, really. Um, old miners that, that had been um, brought back together, who used to be old mates. Um, so it had a real value this session, um, and I, and I think obviously one of the main things that that people were saying was that the community roots um, had, had been missing for so long. So talking about um, the gap between the current community, because I didn't just want to engage with past presence of the past residents of the community. It was about educating people there now about the history of their area. So we reached out to another school, the East Manchester Academy, which is just across the road um, from the pit, really. Um, and the, the guy that you can see there is a maker called Joseph Hartley. Um, and what we did is we used the oral history interviews and we, we named the workshop. It was a three day workshop with a group of students and we named it Generations Interpretations. We wanted to see what from listening to oral histories of the miners, what, what kids' interpretations were of, of a pit now and did they know what things looked like? Um, so we, we brought we brought along a whole host of, of materials to kind of inspire them. Um, so when they were listening to the oral histories, the first thing was to for them to draw what, what they thought objects looked like down the pit from the descriptions in the interviews. Um, this was, was one of the kids' interpretations of what would be a tally hook. So when, when men went down the pit, they'd hang the tallies up. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the kids used blue because the, the miners were talking about having um, blue scars from coal dust being stuck, stuck in the scars. Um, so this was somebody's interpretation of a miner's lamp. Uh, but it was just really interesting to see what, um, what, pe what younger people's imaginations were about about you know what machinery looked like etc and then on the final day um the miners came in and saw what they'd made and they could actually they were like you've done a really good job they, they could actually recognize some of the some of the objects as things that they described in their interviews so, so that was quite um that was quite a good a good highlight from the engagement another thing was um 
to to try and visualize and and orientate people with that with that area when so many changes had been made um so we did a call out called um drawing out bradford um and older older residents of the area that used to live in bradford came along to try and help us uh, map and orientate um the area um Bradford Park is still there today, but they were they were describing things um, that used to be there. Um, and I just wanted to then now go on to um, some of the, the highlights from the archive process as well. Um, as I mentioned, one of the things um, was that we we really um, needed archive evidence uh, for Central Library, um, so we issued some call outs. Um, and archive handling and deposit sessions at, at, at Manchester Central Library. Um, these were some amazing photographs that got sent through to us from a guy in Australia whose uncle, the guy in the picture, Alf Grundy, uh, worked at Bradford Pit and he actually took these photos underground. So it was amazing to be able to see, um, you know, what, what the pit actually looked like underground as well. Um, and the, you know, the images are, are absolutely amazing. Just flip through these. Another fantastic thing that we found is I got contacted by a geologist called Anthony France, um, who actually used to survey down Bradford Pit. Um, and I, I went to his house, which was um, quite a long way away, actually. Uh, I got the train there. And um, he had like 100, hundreds and hundreds of ordnance survey maps in his loft. Um, and one that he'd brought down was, was a Bradford pit. Uh, so if I just zoom in for you there, but it, it, it kind of shows the seams and workings across the city centre. Um, so Roger seam was the biggest seam, um, the biggest seam and, and Roger coal was the best grade quality coal that you could get from Bradford. Um, it really just shows kind of the vast networks of tunnels and workings that, that, that the miners kind of um, dug out, if you like. Um, and, and they were actually, um, the pit was actually made, um, made it to the Guinness World Book of Records for the most, the most coal dug in a day, which is something that they're really proud of. Um, another highlight from the archive was, um, a lady called Rose Broadhurst came to me um, with, with some um, archives from her, her husband, Fred, who had recently passed away, who was a Bevin boy down Bradford Pit. Um, and he'd written a journal, a vast journal about his time there, um, which we digitized and we, we submitted to the archive. Um, but one of the most beautiful things about it is that he'd actually done drawings from memory and they were really kind of accurate drawings. So, um, you know, just things around kind of seam names and things like that, making lots and lots of notes, um, but re really, really interesting. And then another story from, from, um, from kind of generating materials. Um, so this, this, but banner was found and it's in an original Bradford Colliery banner um, at the Moston Miners Club um, years and years ago. And it was in a skip ready to be chucked out. Um, so um, my dad's friend, Brian Grayson, whose dad was a miner at Bradford Pit, rescued it and it's been in his house ever since. Um, but we actually took it to the People's History Museum to kind of get conservation advice. Um, and think about what you know whether Brian wanted to to kind of donate it somewhere because he really feels like it should be shown. Um, but the the kind of ethos at the bottom of it, which is unity, progress, strength, is something that we've incorporated with it within the memorial for the project. So uh, that's a nice example as well. Going on next to um, 2016, which is it was an exhibition called Unity to Progress Strength, and again as part of Manchester History's Festival 2016, um, this was really um, bringing together and showcasing everything that had been done in the project, um, and um, you know showing archive material and the engagement and the momentum that had been built up. 
um, to showcase it to high level stakeholders, but to the community and public as well. Um, so these are some images um, of the exhibition at Beswick Library, which was it was extremely well attended. Um, and Manchester School of Art students helped us to create this. So they did all the kind of graphic de design be behind it and it informed some of their learning as well. Uh, these are some of the objects that, um, that the Manchester School of Art um, students produced which had been inspired by by meeting some of the miners and lots of people came and shared and shared memories which was fantastic as a result of the the success of the exhibition um it was also shown that there was increased footfall and visitors to Beswick library because i think they've been struggling for a while to get people in so the the council then funded elements of the exhibition to be um, to be kind of um, installed permanently, which was fantastic. Um, those massive, bold images of the miners was a student's artwork based on some oral histories they'd listened to. And some of these have been used within a the permanent memorial, which is which was been great as well. There's Mike again uh, with his uh, city and mining um, T-shirt that he'd had made. So at the end of the run of the exhibition, um, myself and a group of miners did a speech um, to uh, the lead of the council. We invited high level stakeholders to say, this should be done, look at all, look at all this need, look at all this public momentum. Um, and from that evening, I, I delivered um, a speech with the miners sat, sat beside me. Um, and there was like a question and answer session with the miners after that. Um, and the council then gave formal approval for this to go ahead. Um, and um, they put some resource from the council in place to help me to get it to, to the next stage. Um, so the next stage of the project was, was um, about um, putting a proposal forward to Eastland Strategic Board, uh, which basically are, are responsible for anything that happens within that re the regeneration of that area. So that got um, that got signed off in, in November 2019, which was absolutely amazing. Um, and we got allocated funding to design and manufacture the memorial. The next part of this was around um, community consultation about what this, this artwork should look like. Um, so we, we did a session at Mary Dee's Beamish Bar, uh, which is the City Fans Club in, um, in East Manchester. Um, and we we um, got involved some um, designers called Broadbent Studio who have done many mining memorials and they, they, they developed the National Coal Mining Museum's memorial as well. Um, Lucy, who you can see talking there, was um, actually a friend of mine from the School of Heart and her, her dad is Stephen Broadbent. So they actually provided in-kind consultation to the project for many years to help me try and achieve what it is that, that we wanted. Um, so the miners were kind of looking through some design scenarios, um, what they think it should look like. But this consultation process was really important. We actually used this opportunity as well to, to capture some really beautiful portraits of, of the miners, um, which could kind of be put into the archive as, um, to match with their oral hist history interviews. It's my nana rigger. <laughs> and then we, after the consultation period, we came up with this design, which was which was within the budget, um, and it mirrors um, the lift shaft um, and pit head, if you like, of, of, um, of Bradford Colliery. Uh, we felt that a really significant um, part of it was be to put the map overlay on image that you saw at the beginning of the presentation for people to try and interpret the changes within the area um, and kind of pinpoint where the pit, the, pit, the pit was. And we included those really bold illustrations of the miners as well. So it looked as though they were kind of going down um, and descending into the earth. And then um, 
hooray! It, <laughs> after a long period of waiting for funding to come through, we thought that it was never ever going to happen. Um, from from submitting the proposal and getting approval in 2017, it took three years to get to this point, to get to keep within budget. And I really didn't think that it had happened, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. Um, but in October, I got the call from the designers to say the memorial's manufactured and it's it's waiting to go. Um, and this was the day that we we installed it. So this was in November last year. Um, obviously, still still in in COVID nineteen, um, but it was a, be a beautiful day. Um, just an amazing, amazing. Um, so the, the actual location of the memorial um, is, is literally, you know, yards away from, from the pit head. Um, and it's, it's a place that can be kind of, it's within a kind of garden setting so people can go and sit and reflect. Um, it is on the, the Etihad site as well. Um, and this is the memorial plaque, which we've kind of thanked the key, the key miners that have been um, the driving force behind it and the partners involved. And this was Mike who drove past on the day that it was being installed. He obviously couldn't get out of his car, um, but it's just been absolutely amazing to see um, his lifelong dream come true. Um, so I think to kind of summarise, we're, we're hoping we're hoping that when we come out of COVID, we can do the huge unveiling event that we we'd always dreamed of. You know, we were thinking we were we were in talks about you know having a, a community procession with some of the banners, um, um, a speech, and some of the, the school children doing a play. Um, so that dream is still is still there. We just we just can't officially unveil the memorial at the minute, but it is open to the public to go along and see. Um, so just kind of touching on the legacy and the impact, I think um, I've been doing a lot of work, um, well, for the presentation, for this presentation, but also kind of evaluating the project. Um, and I think the key thing has been that the real impact that it's had in kind of bringing old miners and communities and friends back together and really educating future generations around um, a nationally significant, internationally significant uh, um, part of Manchester's history. Um, so at this point, I think I've been bang on, bang on 40 minutes, like I said. Uh, so yeah, it'd be great to just have a chat, answer any questions, that would be brilliant. Very impressive, Lauren. Well, and you are a very impressive person. As, as we spotted in 2013, it's been fantastic to follow the progress of the project and brilliant. Many congratulations on, on, on getting that memorial up. It looks fantastic. Uh, worth a walk out from town, folks, if you want to go and, uh, and have a look. You've lots of nice messages in the in the chat, uh, Lauren. So um, I'll, I'll forward the chat to you for, for so many people enthused by what you've been saying. Um, does anybody want to ask a specific question? Um, I can get you back into... Oh, Lu Lucy, some, now I've got somebody talking, somebody, some strange... Uh, if you can mute yourself, if you're not asking a question, that would be good. Thank you very much. Um, Lois, uh, let me try and unmute you. Hang on, I've got sun on my screen. I mean, I don't want to complain about having sun on my screen. screen. Yeah, go for it, Lois. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lynette. Um, I really have enjoyed this talk. I used to work at the Manchester College, and, and I, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, shall I meet mine? <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay. All right. So I was, I was just saying, I really enjoyed the talk. I was interested in the miners' estate and does it still exist and when was it built? It, um, yes, it does still exist. Um, so um, it's a, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Moston at all. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not far from what used to be the Broadway pub. So it's just off Broadway. 
Um, right. And yes, I think it was built around the 60s because I know that um, my granddad, my granddad did live there before he's had his he had his accident. Um, right. so I think it was around kind of the late 50s, 60s time. Um, but yeah, it's it's very much still still kind of an, an active oh. community today, and and the Moston Miners Community Arts and Music Centre is is still kind of operating from there as well. Oh, very interesting to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, um, Sue says her granddad died as a result of a mining accident, not not in this area, in, in 1919, and her grandma was left with six children, the eldest of whom was 17. So she asked, has there been any research in this area about how wives and widows coped? Yeah, well, I think um, very, very little... <sighs> I suppose really the, the research that I've done is, is re recent history in terms of um, the miners that are alive today. You know, we're talking about um, we're talking about um, accidents that happened within that time. Um, and I think there was relatively few deaths at that time, but you know, years, years and years back, mm -hmm. 1800s, 1700s around the pit's origination. I've read I've read bits about kind of awful awful stories of you know children um children men women um dying down that pit um so so yeah um although there's not much um evidence on bradford colliery in particular it is something that i know obviously did happen so yeah actually looking there's a, there's a broader question about miners wives lives is, is is there any any more you'd like to say about your nan <laughs> for instance yeah well a really lovely part of the project was um the, the miners wives have been very much a part of it um one of the oral histories that we've got um pat pat ahern one of one of the miners ray ray's wife um, sings a little song that was actually unique to Bradford Pitt and the, and the, it's called We Are the Miners Girls um, <laughs> and, and they were very much you know um, a group and a group and a, and a community um, within their own right. One of the students um, from the School of Art was very interested in that element in particular about about you know the, the, the women and supporting and um, I know that um, my nana is um, an inspiration to me because she was she had four children at the time when my my, uh, my granddad was left paralysed. So um, she's a warrior um, for getting through what she's been through over the years, definitely. Thank you, Lucy. You've uh, you've got your hand up. Should you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just want to say thank you so much. Uh -huh. It's really interesting. Um, I'm currently a third year student at, at Manchester School of Art doing illustration. Um, uh -huh. I, I've been working on the value of working class history and people. So it's just really amazing to see an idea and like a creative student and the actual outcome that you can have with it. It, it, it it's really interesting. Oh, thanks so much, Lucy. So Ian Wadcock will be your tutor. Yeah. 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 So exactly. Ian's. Yeah. Ian's done lots of work with uh, with the project before, and with Jacob Jacob Phillips, who who yeah. was a um, an artist from your degree, did the illustrations of the miners. So, um, although um, I didn't actually go into creative stuff in the end, it's just yeah, it's quite a um, a bit of a weird journey, I guess. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah, you can I suppose you can go far just with something you're passionate about, really. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a fantastically creative project, Lauren. I don't know that about <laughs> Gordon, do you want to uh, unmute yourself? Yes, um, a friend of mine, Ivan Fryman, was um, an electrician uh, down the pit uh, when one of the fatalities happened. He was also a folk singer. I'm not too sure whether he or oh. aware of the song. But there, there is a song, there is one or two recordings. There is one recording on Facebook, on um, YouTube. Um, but it's, um, <clears throat> I think it's by um, Ivan Fryman and um, Archie, um, Archie Fisher were the people who wrote it. It's a very moving song. It's, he, was, he, he wrote it on the night um, that, the, uh, that, his, uh, uh, minor, that the miner got, uh, the miner died. No, I've never heard that actually. That sounds amazing. 
Um, yeah, I'll, I'll look that up. If you could share, share the link, that, that'd be fantastic. Let's look, have a look um, at that. If I email it to the... Um, yeah, email should... it to us and I can forward it on. Yeah, definitely. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, there's there's lots of stuff going on in the chat here. People recommending books, etc. And and there are various people here who who worked who worked down the pit, who worked in different pits, but particularly who, who uh, worked in Bradford pits. So if if any of you wants to wave a hand at me and and right, Pete, do um, do unmute yourself. Hello, Lauren. Hello. That was that was really exciting for me because. Uh, I was brought up in Kinlock Street next door to Phillips Park and I was, uh, I'm 70 now. I'm a practicing artist living here in uh, Nottingham. I've ret retired from teaching. I used to teach at Leeds Beckett University Fine Art. Um, but I used to walk past the pit for two decades and I've got a great story. Uh, sadly, it's when it the pit closed, but I've got a great story about one of the chimneys that was dropped. Um, and me and my father, who was a welder at Richard Johnson and Nephews next door, were stood in the United pub on Ashton New Road in the corner of Ashton New Road and Mill Street. And uh, we were all waiting for this chimney to be detonated. And uh, Mill Street had been cleared of traffic. A lot of the houses by that time had gone. Um, and there was one policeman stood in the middle of Mill Street. Um, and suddenly the air went black. It was a bang. The air went black. We waited a few seconds, let the dust settle a bit. And all the guys ran out of the pub with air pints. And we were all stood at the top of Mill Street. And all we could see was a big cloud of dust that was clearing. And there was one copper stood there and he had this helmet on. And he was completely covered in soot. It was quite a sight. And then and everybody went back in the pub and there was a few tears, I have to tell you, because it was the beginning of the end for Bradford. It had already started with the houses being cleared, but it was a very sad time. And I'm getting tearful now because it meant a lot to a lot of people. So what you've done is really remarkable and I must contact you. I'll send my stuff to the uh, organisation there because I did a series of photographs of, where, of what's there now, but I actually subverted the photographs with stories about what was then. So it was like yeah. using memory to do things. So thank uh, you for letting me say that. And it's been a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. God bless everybody there. And God bless you for what you've done. Oh, thank you. So making me tear up now. Yes. I, think I, I, I think we're all having a moment. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> I don't think I don't think the importance of it can be kind of un underestimated about a community was basically ripped, ripped apart. Um, yeah. you know, and, and regeneration and development is great, but people need to be brought along with that journey, don't they? Um yeah. So yeah, completely agree with that. There's there's a film. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's a Northwest Film Archive, and that actually shows um, the the clearance of Bradford. Um, so it documents it, and there's people kind of loot looting looting houses, burning furniture, and just really really awful to 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 watch. But um, yeah, I feel like it's um hopefully brought Bradford and the pit back to the map a little bit. So. Well, there's another, there's another little bit of film uh, that I found on the, B, uh, the BFI network. It's within a bigger film, which is about the revitalization of Manchester uh, in the late 40s. And in that film from 1948, there's about five minutes on the um, resurrection of the pit and the amount of money that they were spending at the time to mm -hmm. redevelop it. And it's quite interesting. You know, right. puts perspective on that whole industrial thing. I mean, when you're a little boy lying in bed, listening to a steelworks at night, was really fantastic. And I miss it so much. Mm -hmm. You know, I've travelled everywhere with the art thing, but I miss that so much. Yeah, sense of community. Brilliant. Yeah. 
Thank, Thank you so you. much, Pete. Thanks, Pete. A, now, before I, Mike's got his hand up, but, it, but Elaine did ask, where exactly is the memorial? So do you want to describe to yeah. us how people can, can get there? The, the best landmark I can give is Tony's Chippy um, <laughs> near the stadium. So so just across the road from, from Tony's Chippy. So the, there's the lights and the junction. Um, so it's kind of um, across the road from Tony's Chippy. You're not you're sort of near Graham Air Lane, but it's it's across the road on the, that side of the site. So that corner, um, and it's on it's on kind of a, a grass a grass surround uh, with with some trees around it. Um, so it's sort of on the walking approach to the to the stadium itself. It, it, if, you, if you get to the tram by Asda, which I can't remember the name of, um, yeah. then it's really close to there, isn't it? Walk, just walk back on yourself a bit and and, uh, and you're there. Yeah, yeah, just just cross over the road from the yeah. tram stop, yeah. Okay, Mike, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hi, hi, yeah. Hi. That, was, yeah. that was absolutely bloody fantastic. It was a cracking talk, uh, and, and we've heard some fantastic stories from pe people around here. Uh, and, and for me, well, a, a few of the biggest things are all the bloody smiles on everybody's faces. And, uh, and that's around memories, it's around looking at the chat. Oh, bloody hell, I know that fella, where's he from? Fantastic. I mean, I, I, I went down the mine once, once. My dad started in uh, Oak, Colliery, which was uh, near Oldham, and uh, with his uh, brother-in-law, and then they moved when Oak closed. I forget when that was, but they moved to uh, to Bradford then, and then in 1959, um, my dad moved down to Kent, and believe it or not, there were some coal mines in Kent then. Um, I mean, there's none in anywhere now, is there? But uh, and then. When I was 15, he said, right, lad, come on, you, you, you're going down. So I thought, oh, blood and sand, I don't fan, fancy this. And, and anyway, he took me down and we went all the way down. And I've never, I mean, that, that bloody lift to the bottom was mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing, the speed of it. And then we got there, he said, right, get, get out. I said, right, oh, well, this doesn't look so bad. It doesn't look so bad, he says, we, we haven't got to walk a mile and a half yet. <laughs> So he took me all the way to the coal face. I had a good look around on my hands and knees, right back up the top. He said, right, lad, what does he think? You fancy a job down there? Not a bloody chance in hell, I said. <laughs> no way. Absolutely no way. So, I mean, my respect are always to, to anyone that, that worked in the pits, really. Um, I mean, it was a shit job. It was it was shit pay, shit conditions, but the camaraderie was bloody fantastic. I have to say. I mean, my dad loved it. He absolutely loved it. Um, he used to drive me mum up the bloody your son would be at bloody pit the gnome you, uh, and he, oh, so fantastic. Anyone here that's worked down the pit, bloody brilliant. But what a fantastic piece of work that that you've done from college. Bloody brilliant. Yeah, well oh, done. Thanks so much, Mike. Oh, well I couldn't done. agree more. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Steve wants to know if you've received any information, Lauren, from the Manchester Region Industrial Archaeology Society or the Association for in, uh, Industrial Archaeology. I haven't, no. Mm. Uh, something might be worth worth following up. Somebody, yeah. somebody has said in the chat. Um, now you've got this uh, uh, this memorial up, but what what are you going to do next? I think I, they're, they're hoping for an, a, another memorial. I think, but um, yeah. Do you do you have, do you have future plans? Yeah. So I think. Um, well, although the memorial's up, I want to kind of add to it around it. So a thing that we're looking at at the minute is. Um, an information panel to go alongside it because it, it probably needs a little bit more context and information about about the background of the pit so I'm looking at additional funding um, and, and designers for that at the moment to hopefully hopefully be put in place this year um, would would love to do and, and, and 
Lucy, this this is, has been a discussion with Ian from the School of Art to do a publication about the pit um, and the project because we've got all this we've got all this um, content, but it's in a it's in a it's in a, an, um, an archive stored away somewhere. I feel like it needs to be in something physical that people can look through. So um, that that would be fantastic. And then I'm still with Lango Rock I'm, I'm on this as well as doing. Um, as well as doing Bradford Pit projects, I've been working on construction projects as well, working with the community. Um, so yeah, I think that's enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I'm up to date with what's in the chat. Does anyone else want to wave at me? Anybody with some some thought? Oh, somebody's suggesting you write a book, by the way. Um, just just throw that one in there. Alex, yes, talk, talk to us. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hello, okay. can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey, Alex. I thank, I thank you. It's great to see Lauren and see her looking so happy. Uh, full of admiration for what she's done. Uh, I am an ex miner myself who started off at Bradford Colliery at 15 years of age on, on the surface before eventually moving on to Agecroft Colliery where I was an underground mechanic or a, a fitter as a called us. Uh, a couple of things that, that have been mentioned. Uh, first of the chapter was on about going down in the, it's a cage, not a lift, it's a cage. Uh, they actually travelled carrying people at 33 feet per second. I don't know what that is in miles per hour. If it was carrying material, it would be 40 feet uh, a second. But I was interested when uh, somebody mentioned miners' wives. Uh, pre, uh, in the early Victorian days and pre-Victorian days, uh, which covers Bradford Pit, the actual miner employed his wife and children to, to, to do the helping out, you know, dragging the coal tubs out full of coal after the miners, you know, dug it out, etc. And up until 1842, when the uh, Mines Act was uh, uh, passed by Parliament, I mean, women and children at any age could work underground, you know, at five years of age, and no doubt because Bradford Colliery was existing pre-Victorian days, no doubt there was many women and miners died down there. I was a bit surprised to hear, well, I think they said it was about one death every five years. In mining terms, certainly back in the day, that, that's actually a very small number, believe it or not. Uh, it's estimated that between 1850 and 1950, there was something up to 100,000 miners actually died in the UK. That's an average of 1,000 uh, a year. But anyway, uh, inspired by, partly inspired by Lauren, I was involved with the uh, Friends of Agecroft Colliery, which I set up. That's where I worked most of my time. And, you know, we managed to get uh, some memorials up. Nothing as grand as the Bradford Pitt Memorial, I have to say. And it, it is lovely. I've, I've looked at it three times. Uh, as soon as I saw the first pictures going up, I was... Jumped in my car, parked it, and as they walked across the road, had a good yandra. It, 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 it's fantastic. Uh, and I think the, the idea of it showing a cage, uh, that truly resonates with me. You know, that really is a mining theme. More, more, more than the... Uh, you've got the mining statues. There's all sorts of memorials up and down the country, which are all... You know, a lot of them are fantastic. But that I've never seen one of a cage. I've seen it uh, pictures rather where there's been an old cage left there, you know, perhaps painted up. There's a similar one in the Lee area where it shows a, a cage uh, coming out of the ground, you know. But that uh, but the what's with, with that cage there and with with a little bit of history added to it, um, I think that that makes it uh, even even more interesting, and, and it's certainly eye catching. And uh, although I've had a good look at it, and I'll be looking at it again several times because uh, I pass the area frequently and I'm, I'm a big Manchester City supporter too so it's a good excuse uh, to get there thanks thanks again Lauren and I got I've got the t-shirt from my Doherty but it also as part of my mining career I did actually work for the uh, Mines Rescue Brigade uh, part-time and there's just something I'd just like to show you here if you don't mind I've, I've got it on my lap um you're probably familiar that uh, canaries uh, were very important down the pit. They, they were very good at testing for uh, carbon monoxide. They were very sensitive to it after, after there'd been a fire or a gas explosion. Uh, and sadly, I, I was involved in the rescue operation at uh, Goldborn Colliery back in 1979 when there'd been an explosion and 10 men lost their lives. As part of the team I was in, it was my job to actually carry the canary 
um, you know, which uh, nothing happened. It was okay. And what a lot of people find out, I believe, is that we actually had a resuscitation apparatus for the canary should it go over. And uh, I've actually got a model of it here, which I'd like to show you now, if you, if, if you don't mind. It's one, I, it's one I've got. Can you? Or if you can see that, please. <laughs> That's, this is what's called the uh, Aldine Reviver. So you can see that that's obviously an oxygen bottle on the top. If the canary went down, it would be put inside. Uh, we carried it. In a, we carried the canary in a cage. But if the canary went down, it would have gone inside uh, the Aldine Reviver and been quickly revived. Why do you use canaries? They could have used any creature, but canaries are very active, jump about a lot. So as soon as they get a bit of oxygen, they go down. You know, I mean, you could use a mouse or anything, but if, with a mouse, you don't know if it's just having a wee in the corner or, or whatever, having more babies. So I just thought that might be of, of some interest to show. Uh, but to conclude, uh, thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much indeed, because I do, I do remember a phone call I got from Lauren at one stage in the very early days, because I did come along to some of the things at Beswick Library, and I know she'd... Uh, was feeling very down at one point over something that had actually been said. Um, I think I cheered her up. I, I told her about people having pit dads and if, and if she needed a, not, perhaps not a pit dad, but a pit, un, pit uncle, I'd be, I'd be a pit uncle for her, you know. <laughs> and, uh, I, I was glad she, I, I was really glad she, uh, she carried on because I do know on the phone call I received from her at one stage, and going back six or seven years, uh, she, she wasn't very happy though, over something, which we won't go into because that wouldn't be fair. But uh, but she's carried on a magnificent job she's done, a true memorial to mining. And unfortunately, there's been hundreds, thousands of pits across the UK, and many of them, especially in my area, I live in Swinson. Uh, there's no memorials to several of the pits that, uh, that are there. Many pits have just gone, and they're just landscapes over houses built on them, etc. There's going to be a lasting. Memorial to Bradford Colliery, and I think that'll be there well after Laura, uh, Laura, Lauren has gone. So thanks, Lauren. You're a star. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Take Thank care. Brilliant. Thank you, Alex. Well, I, I, we've uh, we've we've seen it all now. We've seen a canary reviver. I, I tell you, we've got to about forty of our online talks, and that is definitely a first. Alex, that's that's fantastic. Thank you very thank you very much indeed. Sorry, Lauren, did you want to respond to anything that Alex said? Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, Alex has been an amazing supporter of the project for, for a long, long time. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for all your support. <laughs> Uh, we, we did a, a, a project also called Invisible Histories, which was an oral history project some years ago, and Agecroft was one of the three Salford workplaces that we focused on. So there are interviews. If you go onto our, our website, uh, Alex or anybody else, you will find a link through to um, the uh, the Agecroft interviews, uh, which uh, which oh, a good few years ago now, but still, yes, yeah, so, certainly, hopefully, still of interest. And a lot of material, as you can imagine, about uh, mining and miners at the library, particularly about the union side of things. And we do have some banners. We have a, we have a, a lot of archive material, but um, also a, a loads of badges from the miners strike, as you, as you might expect. But um, again, have, have a look on our website or, or drop us a line if you want to know uh, what we have at the library about, uh, about mining and miners. Eleanor, were you waving at me? Yes, do you want to unmute yourself? Right. Oh, I just want to thank Lauren for a fantastic talk. And I think that this, she must be the youngest woman to have tackled a subject which was almost entirely men work, men's work. And I think absolutely fantastic. And uh, it'll be, we're having a break now, I think, from talks, but uh, I think that she will be very, very, very difficult to uh, other than ones that come after will be very very difficult I find it difficult to actually you know re reach up to that standard fantastic thanks oh, thanks so much Eleanor <laughs> right yes yeah yeah truly a story I mean invisible histories is is the the um 
portmanteau title that we give these talks and and this really is such a huge area which is an invisible history and it's a idea it's a history for all of manchester we've heard some blue stories and you will notice i'm wearing red and it is a story for for definitely for for all of manchester um has anybody got anything else they would like to say i have sun in my eyes which is fantastic you're gonna have to wave quite hard if you want to <laughs> No, I think we could be getting there, right. Okay, well, Lauren, oh, Maggie, are you waving at me? Do you want to say something? You need to unmute, Maggie, if you want to say something. Can you unmute? Yeah, and just actually obviously echo what Eleanor said. It was a fantastic talk and, and thank you very much. I just wondered now, you know, um, you mentioned oh, two things, really, the minus wives that you, you mentioned so often when it's mines were in villages outside towns in Yorkshire and so on and I know in the Cheshire Lancashire sort of coalfield um but women did continue to work above ground didn't they um uh um when they weren't allowed to work underground and uh um but I just um wondered because there would be other employment around in in Beswick, um, I wondered, you know, what other work they did, if you know. But also, really, to what what is the current? Is there any current employment in Beswick? Are there any, you know, because you mentioned that there were factories and and mills and so on. I, mean, I wondered what the situation in Beswick is now. Yeah, just to yeah, touch on the em employment part. Um, I think um, if you if you do go there, it it's, it still does feel quite a sparse place. Um, so I know that through the through the regeneration and um, as as the big ASDA um, that was put in place kind of across the road has, has brought so much employment um, to the area. It's it's kind of a, a bit of a superstore. Um, I know that. The, the football club itself does does employ a lot of people uh, locally as well um but no there's not um there's not kind of many you know little shops around or any anything like that anymore it's just um yeah i suppose it'd be kind of um people going into the city center i know that when when the pit closed people just dispersed all over the place for work um, I've had a lot of miners contacting me from, you know, Wales, um, all across the country because they, they had to move, they had to move to where the work was. Um, so yeah, I think, um, yeah, and I think the regeneration of East Manchester is kind of ongoing. So there's, there's like plans to do a lot more around jobs and the economy and things like that. Um, and then I think with the miners' wives, um, perhaps Alex would be the best place to, to answer that about um, miners' wives, you know, working on the pit top and what, and what I suppose, what, what other industries were around the pit that they were employed by. Is getting something. <laughs> right, I'm, Alex, did, were you waving at me again? Did you want to say some more? Uh, yeah, I was asked to ask, uh, answer a question about miners' wives. So I've got a drawer next to me full of books, and I'm just trying to find the one on pit bro lasses. Uh, All right. I uh, yeah, it was quite. I could only, I could only mainly speak for Agecroft Colliery, but I do know it did happen at other collieries. Now, um, although since 1842 only men were allowed to work underground, obviously many women worked on the top, uh, usually as, as uh, pit bro lasses, but obviously. There's lots of women on the surface in various roles. Either the canteen ladies, it was usually, you know, there were nearly always somebody's mother, somebody's wife, somebody's sister, etc. Uh, so that was the case. Uh, and, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm fiddling about in a drawer next to me trying to pick that book up. I've got all sorts of mine in <laughs> rubbish in there. But You've not got I'm, another uh, canary. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'll have to leave it. I might have to put it somewhere. There's, there's that, the pit bro lasses, obviously, the, the, they're nearly all gone now, but there is one lady left, uh, Rita Culshaw. If anybody, if you can remember that, Rita Culshaw. Uh, she's believed to be the last existing pit bro lass alive. She lives in Wigan. 
Uh, and I had arranged for her to come down to talk to a local history club uh, last year, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, that's been put off. Rita's still there. She's actually on a few of the mining Facebook sites, so uh, I communicate with uh, with her regularly. You know, but... Uh, uh, and talking of miners' wives, obviously, uh, I think they came to, uh, well, they got an high profile during the miners, the big strike of 84, 85, where, uh, uh, where, where there was a lot of support for the, for, for the men who were on strike, uh, in particular in, in, in the Yorkshire area. So they did a, a fantastic job. Yeah, but uh, there, there, was, there was, I can't say there was a lot of women, but there was certainly, uh, speaking of Agecroft Colliery, which I have to, because uh, that's where I spent most of my working life. I mean, I think most of the women there who, who were on the surface, be you know, the, the work cleaners, office cleaners, the, there was the canteen stuff, staff, there was secretarial staff for, you know, for, for, for the managers, et cetera. Most of them uh, would have been related to a minor, perhaps not all, uh, but, but certainly, you know, now, and I imagine... Well, I don't imagine, I do know that that would be the case all over the country. Why I say I do know, I'm, I'm a bit obsessed with mining now. I wasn't when I worked there, I was glad to get out, uh, if the truth be told. But so, uh, the gentleman mentioned camaraderie before. That was the thing I missed. When they announced my pit was uh, closing, uh, I won't deny it. Uh, after a day or two of thinking about it, all the people I've missed, I actually broke down and cried down the pit with a very good friend of mine. Uh, I was just so upset, not at losing the job and, and being made redundant, missing the people. And that's what part, partly inspired me eventually to set up my own group, Friends of Age, Croft Crawler, which I'm really proud to say has over a thousand members. That's, that's as a Facebook site. We, we've done some fundraising and done some things in Swinton, you know, and I'm very, and I'm very pleased with that. And I have to say, uh, it, it's very nice when we have the get togethers and the fun that uh, uh, many of the wives actually joined in. And I think most, although I'm divorced now, I do have to say uh, my wife, was very supportive of me, you know, when I worked in the industry and had to put up with a lot because I had a, a few bad accidents. Uh, because I was on a main, maintenance crew, we would be sometimes called out to uh, awkward hours, uh, particularly over something like a Christmas period or early period when the mines uh, were shut down for production of calling, but they still had to be maintained. Agecroft, for example, was a very wet uh, mine. We pumped out something like one million gallons of water every day. The part of my job was maintaining uh, the pumps, and I, I, I remember being woke up at I think two o'clock in the morning. You know, I'd, I'd done my shift down there anyway, but because it was a, an holiday period, I can't remember what Easter, Christmas, or whatever. And it was, you know, this pump had broken down. They needed to get it going. I had to get out of bed, but and, and I lived very close in what was a, a coal board house. You know, um, somebody's mentioned the, the Moston Miners estate and what I've been into, into Mick Doherty's house. Uh, I met him there. I've, I've, I've seen his models. I brought the sick T-shirt off him at Bradford Colliery, et cetera, et cetera, you know. But the uh, the, the old coal owners, be, be, before the National Coal Board uh, was instigated in 1947, they did build houses for the, for the miners. And uh, I did live in one of those houses, although it was... Um, managed by the National Coal Board at the time. So I, I was very close to the pit and it was very easy to pick on me or call on me uh, to come in. Not happy about it, but the, uh, I did get a uh, sort of fairly well paid for it being caught because it, it, it probably something that I'd only be there perhaps a couple of hours, I'd fixed a, a pump that was pumping water up the shaft, sent back home, you know, a couple of hours later and got paid a full shift for it. So I was quite happy with that, you know, but uh, it's, it's the... And people, camaraderie is a, is, a, is a good word to use because it, it, it is a very, very, very strong sense amongst the mining community to still. The, Al, the Canaries Aldine Reviver I just brought off here, I, I actually bid for that. It was in a, an auction where they're raising money for another memorial over on the other side of the Pennines. And it was a, it was a starting bid of 60, I bid 70, and just got it straight away. So I drove over to the rough side of the Pennines collected that up from uh, his next colliery manager by the way I had a lovely one I was chat with him or so at the, the most so wake happy there because it was still uh, there was restrictions on we couldn't meet at each other's house or whatever you know but uh, we could meet at the most so wake happy the one just just over the Pennines I can't remember what it's called the very first one so so all that it was fantastic 
and I'm still feel I'm still feeling about for that book on fit and lashes. I, I think it must be oh, so don't worry, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> there have been lot there have been lots of different um suggestions of books actually in the chat. So if anybody wants drop me an email if you'd like me to send you the transcript of the chat. Lauren, I'll certainly send it to you because people have been so appreciative. Uh, so um you definitely need to see it. But anybody else, and I know that there's been offers of a book going out uh, uh, that, that that can be posted out. So Again, if you want to find out anything that, that's currently in the chat, either quickly save it now before we close down or, or just drop us a line at um, info at wcml.org.uk or click on the contact us button and uh, we'll be glad to be involved. And I think we've had some good camaraderie today. It's been the word, hasn't it? So thank you very much to everybody for, for all your contributions, Lauren particularly, it's been just fantastic to, um, to, to hear more about what you persevered and, and gone on and done. I just loved that picture of you looking so excited when the, the memorial was, was going up and you, <laughs> you, you deserve all the praise that you've got today. And, and uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your enthusiasm uh, with us. That's been absolutely terrific. Um, now, as uh, somebody said, we are having a bit of a pause now. We're having an Easter break. And the next talk is going to be on Wednesday, the 28th of April at two o'clock. So can I encourage you to look at our website? I've put up all the, the, the new set of talks, which are going to run from the 28th of April through till June. So there's details of them all on the What's On page on our website. So do please take a look on that. If you've uh, joined us late or if you'd like to recommend some to your friends to, that, that they would like to hear this talk, it has been recorded and it will be going up on our YouTube channel later today. That's youtube.com forward slash WCM library. And uh, so I will just close by thanking Lauren again very much indeed. And thank you to everybody else. And to say, as I always do, take care everybody and very best wishes in solidarity from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone.